So the other evening, I uh, logged onto my computer, selected this photograph of a green crested lizard I'd seen in Dairy Farm Nature Reserve, and posted it on my blog. Today I logged on and found out that an indie musician somewhere in the United States had reblogged it, exclaiming to his 7,000 followers, this lizard is glowing neon green, I swear. A woman suffering from Cowden syndrome, a rare genetic disorder, and attempting to raise money and awareness for it through her blog, had commented on how freaking cool this was. A business graduate turned artist buried somewhere in the depths of Idaho had noted the animal's anthropomorphism. In total, people from over 40 different countries viewed the blog, from places ranging from Swaziland to Guernsey. But none of this is new. We all know that the internet has transformed the way we interact with each other forever, but the implications this has had for not just how we interact with the person next to us, but also with our natural world, have been transformative, but not necessarily in a good way. The internet has enabled the creation of tools that have allowed the collection of information on biodiversity on an unprecedented scale. But the very scale of that information may have endangered species more than previously. The thing is, barriers have been broken. Geographic, linguistic, and cultural boundaries dissolved into a confusing mass of cyberspace. And some have taken full advantage of the benefits this can have for wildlife. I'd like to introduce you to Project NOAA. Uh, I was introduced to the site through the Singapore American School seventh grade science program during the rainforest unit, when you spend one or two months out in our school rainforest documenting biodiversity and figuring out the problems that face it. So think of the website as a sort of social media for wildlife. In the same manner as Instagram, you take a picture, upload it, then sit back and wait for the comments and favors to start rolling on in. But there's a catch. The photograph that you take has to be of wildlife, though what that means is up to you. It could be a microbe you find in a nearby pond if you happen to possess an electron microscope, or it could be a tree you've always loved but have never known the species of. Because when scrolling through update feed, you're just as likely to see a blackberry bush as you are a Kwanzaa flowering cherry. And the best part is, actually, the second best part about this is, is that every time you hit upload, the information you give about the organism you spotted, its habitat, its behaviors, where you saw it, gets added to Project NOAA's growing database of information on wildlife across the globe. The best part is, is that you can take a step beyond simply collecting that information to applying it in real, sci in real scientific research. Researchers have taken advantage of the barriers Project NOAA have broken, has broken to reach out to people across the globe to collect data from, regardless of what language they speak or what religion they practice. With Project NOAA, you can help with everything from tracking the impacts of the Gulf oil spill to monitoring ladybug distribution across America. The latter is more commonly known as the Lost Ladybug Project. It was, it was started, started by Professor Cornell, worried, worried about, about declining, declining native ladybug, ladybug numbers, numbers in the US, specifically, specifically those of the 9 ladybug. ladybug. Now, now, this insect is, is the state, state insect of New York, New York. But, but when he when started, he started the project, project, it hadn't, it hadn't had had actually, actually been seen, seen in, in the state, state for, for over 20, 20 years. years. But, but, but within we weeks of the project beginning, in, in, in fact, on the very first field test in Virginia, 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 they found, they found it. it. And, and it wasn't was some, some high school researcher with a PhD, some student at MIT found it. It was an 11 year old. And then and both 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 and, and, and Jonathan, who found the found first, first nine of ladybug, ladybug on the on East, East Coast, Coast in, in over 20 years. years. Since, Since then, then, 
they found 44 in George's previously previous 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 previous
There have been like thousands of photographs of it that have even won nationally acclaimed photo contests like National Geographic's or the Smithsonian Magazine's. Though, of course, if we want to absolve ourselves of all guilt from, for, the, for occurrences like these, we could say that, yeah, those are just a couple of phot photographic bad eggs, some people who just don't care about wildlife. And sure, if you want to, you can do that. But it's not just people like this that are the problem. It's also the information that we post. I'd like you to meet Karambe. He's the largest black rhinoceros on the Maasai Mara, with a horn well over two meters in length, and worth well over two million on the black market. Researchers of East African biodiversity could learn a lot from him. But when I posted his image to Project Noah a few months back, I had to keep his location secret. The same information so valuable to researchers could just as easily be used by poachers to pinpoint the location of monetarily animals. And the thing is, these are only some of the problems that have arisen over the past few years as we've become more and more aware of them. They're only going to increase. But as we keep these in mind, as we go about using tools like the Great Nature Project and Project NOAA, we also need to keep in mind how much good we can do. And so I'd like to conclude with the story of the little terns at Tua South. Now, this animal is a nationally endangered species in Singapore. So when it was reported that it had had chicks at Tua South, these little fluffy balls are frankly adorable, but photographic community and wildlife community was jubilant. People rushed there in droves, documenting the chicks' every move from hatching to fledging. One morning, it was relatively empty. There was a group of three photographers and a solitary birder who was seeing the chicks for the first time. One of the photographers decided he didn't like the position that the chicks were sitting in. And so, taking out a piece of twine from his bag, he physically picked up the chick and tied its leg to a bush. Above its parents circled, calling in distress. The birder took a few photographs of what had transpired and then left, too distressed to say anything or to confront two people in an isolated location far from most communication. When he got home, he posted the photographs to Facebook and the internet exploded in self-righteous anger. And Initially, he wanted to keep the what had happened secret, but eventually, on the urging of thousands of commenters from across the globe, he reported it to AVA, the Agri-Food and Veterinary Authority of Singapore. And the photographers were identified and slapped with a $500 fine, and we all celebrated a seeming triumph of the internet over the bad guys of the world. Good for us again, yay. But it's not that simple. The internet was the vehicle of both sides of the story. It was why the photographer picked up that chick and tied his leg to a bush, but it was also where the photographer was brought to justice. Yes, it's a very complicated issue, and it's only going to grow more and more complicated as the line of walking between helping and hurting grows thinner by the day because we have a lot of power in our hands right now, literally at the click of a button. But as someone very wise once told me, with great power comes great responsibility. Because it's a brave new world out there full of wonderful things to see, to discover, to learn, to explore, and whether we keep it that way, whether we use the tools we've been given for good and not for evil, well, that, that is only up to us. Thank you.